In two trades running, the protagonist is a bank robber. August Wilson's stepfather spent 23 years in a state penitentiary. I myself would not go out and rob a bank. I do not sanction anyone going out and rob a bank. The people who do that, I recognize that as a resistance. There, there is a resistance, in, in, for instance, in terms of learning the language. Uh, and, and there's a resistance to speaking what is known as proper and correct English. You see, because blacks are very creative in their linguistic, uh, 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 linguistic agility is very highly, highly uh, uh, prized. You see, so when blacks do not speak the language correctly, I think that's a form of resistance. So it's not just taking a, putting a gun in your hand and going out and robbing a bank, although I recognize that as a form of resistance. It's the language. It's the resistance in terms of the language. <laughs> Hey, girl, where you worked at before? Wendy, I can tell. You real slow. They got a job for you at Giant Eagle, cashier. You'd probably be slow on that, too. My difficulty in, in terms of writing plays was actually very simple. And I couldn't write dialogue because I didn't respect uh, the way that blacks talked. I, I didn't value the way that blacks talked. I thought in order to create art out of it that you had to change the way they talked. And so when I wrote these plays, and then I did attempt to write plays, I really had black characters talking like Europeans. You see, because I thought this is what you had to do. And I remember asking Rob Penny one time, how do you make your characters talk? And he said, you don't, you listen to them. Uh, I did not think at the time they had given me any great pearl of wisdom. I thought he was trying to be smart. And it was until many years later, six or seven years later, that I actually began to listen. But before I can listen and before I could hear the, the, the language of the people, I had to learn to value it. Uh, and that's something that I had to discover within myself. And once I discovered the value and the poetry that was inherent in the way that, that black spoke, I had no problem uh, with uh, writing dialogue. It was only after moving to Minnesota to live with his new wife right, that August Wilson way, found out way. how to write dialogue with a play based on the illegal minicabs or jitneys of the Hill District. Anyway, I visited Pittsburgh with my wife and we drove and she had never encountered gypsy cabs or, or jitney stations. And on the way uh, driving back home, which is a 950 mile, one mile drive, I spent the whole entire time explaining to her uh, what, the, what a jitney was these guys would get together and they would rent an abandoned storefront, get a pay telephone in there, and they would pay uh, $15 a month dues to work out of there and, and uh, disseminate the, the number into the community. And when you wanted transportation, you called one of the many jetney stations. Service. 2024 Grove Place. All right, great car. Your mother's still alive? Oh, I gotta get you some white flowers. Yours? I never believed in flowers, man. You know, I never did believe in flowers. Even when I was a kid, I didn't like them. She'd put them on me, I'd go to church, and I'd tear it off right after church, you know. So when I got but, uh, back home, I was very excited. The idea occurred to me, why don't I write a play that is set in a jitney station? That so explains this to whoever doesn't know it. And also, you can sh see uh, the, the idea that the men have created these jobs out of nothing, uh, and they're able to support their families through that. So I began to work on this play called Jetney. And this was the very first play in which I, I listened uh, uh, to, the, to the dialogue, as opposed to trying to force it into the mouths of the characters. I simply uh, let them talk. And I was uh, very excited and very surprised with the results of what I was able to come up with. I discovered that, that I could write dialogue. And not only could I write dialogue, but I could write a lot of dialogue. You see, it was, once I got the characters talking, it was difficult to shut them up. Yeah. Who? No, you got the wrong number. Hey, turn, but what's happening? Hey, ceiling. Boy, I don't know what this world is coming to. What's up, man? You know McNeil, don't you? Who? McNeil. McNeil will live up on, on Webster, old lady McNeil. Got them two boys and work cleaning up down at the courthouse. McNeil? No, 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 McNeil, you know, man. I'm talking about McNeil. It used to be Brownie's old lady. Brownie was staying up there helping to try to raise them two boys. 
One of them got an old funny shaped head. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, now I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, the boy come in here a little while ago this morning. Uh -huh. The oldest one. Can't be no more than 18, 19 at the most. Asked me to take him on a trip up to the north side. Mm. Then he say he want to stop up here on White Side Road. So I carry him up there. He get out and go to into one of these houses, come out carrying a television. A TV. The boy ain't said nothing about no television now. No. Then he want to put it in my back seat. No. I tell him, hell no, you ain't messing up my back seat. No, man. So I help him put it in the trunk, man. Then he had me carry him down to the pawn shop on the north side. Pawn shop. Now, I know the boy done stole the television, but uh -huh. I ain't saying nothing. No. I want my money. Yeah. Right? Come on back, stop down there, pass to get some tobacco. And the fella sitting around happened to mention the name of this woman who done had her television stolen. Don't you know that boy done went and stole his grandmama's television? What? The name is Bolger, Miss Sarah Bolger. Now, this is old lady McNeil's mama. I used to carry the church all the time before she got too old to go. Lord have <laughs> mercy. The boy done went and stole his grandmama's television. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> well, much of